Uh, no, again, my name is Jared Ball. It, it is an honor to be here um, uh, to, to uh, get to exchange and share some ideas, learn some things, uh, and of course to talk about Paul Robeson or in the context of Paul Robeson. It's always an honor to do that. Um, so I have a, a few loosely organized comments and ideas to share, and then uh, I think I'm going to bring the brother up here. We're going to you know, share some time a little bit, and then um, uh, maybe even have a, a little Q&A. Uh, I'd like to leave some room for that to hear from you all as well. Um, but I'm here to talk about, uh, as Baruch once was put it, uh, uh, to talk about Paul Robeson in the context of, of my own Iron Triangle. Um, and for those who aren't familiar, and I even went back and looked it up last night to be reminded of, of where that concept comes, in, in, in quote, in the United States politics, the Iron Triangle comprises the policymaking relationship among the congressional committees, the bureaucracy, and interest groups, as described in 1981 by Gordon Adams. My version of it is the colonial state, the psych psychological warfare apparatus or media, and interest groups, which include uh, lofted expressions of black capitalism. So, so in short, what I'm saying is my iron triangle is you can't be rich, famous, and politically radical at the same time. And there is zero exception to that rule historically. Uh, I, I'm, I'm op up for discussion and debate on that, but I think that's the best way to approach and understand the, the, uh, um, the role that celebrity is meant to play and what Robeson himself walked into uh, in his lifetime. By the way, Baruch uh, uh, set me up with, he wanted to mark me as a, as a communist, so he gave, no, I'm just messing with you. He wanted to mark me as a radical, so he gave me a pen that bled on my hand, so I'm just wanna, yeah, I appreciate that. Now I've been marked officially as. <laughs> um, so, so anyway, so, so when we end up t thinking about what, what Paul Robeson did, uh, Paul Robeson broke every major unspoken rule and some of the written ones, as documents have later come out, they, some of them are actually written, uh, about the construction and maintenance of celebrity. Uh, he spoke of himself proudly as an African and coming from the African-American context, we can come back and talk about that, referring to himself as an African, uh, particularly then, even now, is a is controversial and powerful political statement, one that puts a target on, one, uh, on, a, on an individual. He self-described as a pan-Africanist, a socialist and a communist at different, at different times, uh, a defender of labor, and openly advocated on the behalf of these movements and people. And, uh, uh, and as he was doing this, the apparatuses of negation were being further developed. The machinery of US and Western neo-colonial expansion, particularly post-World War II, concretizing its psychological warfare parallel in the culture industries, the enhanced study and development of academic study of application of psychological warfare described in euphemism by my field of study as mass communication, uh, and the constructed role of celebrity. So in other words, as Robeson comes in to his career, in the early part of the 20th century, the, the US and its Western allies were actively, openly looking to construct a reality that they could project into the world that would support their dominance in place, that would suppress communism, suppress labor, suppress black liberation uh, all over the world. And as we just saw the other day, um, actually within the last month, we got two, I think it's been within the last month. The Guardian did that story recently about how Kwame Ture, who they would only refer to uh, as Stokely Carmichael, uh, not wanting to acknowledge his name change and his political evolution, kept. Ref but they, but the article pointed out that they had that the that the British state had been working with the West uh, to surveil him, put him under surveillance, and to limit his ability specifically to spread the idea that black power meant socialism and Pan Africanism. Um, so I thought that was, for those of us who study this history, that's not news, but I thought it was important to see that come out in The Guardian, uh, specifically noting that it was his socialism and pan-Africanism, the idea that black people in the United States were part of an African diaspora that needed to organize, unify for, for uh, specifically as an Nkrumah Tereist, uh, uh, for United States of Africa 
uh, under scientific socialism. So when he was, while Kwame Ture and others were redefining black power along those more appropriate lines, you of course had Nixon and the US state redefining openly black power as black capitalism and mainstream participation in, black, in electoral politics and actively saying, uh, as Nixon did, we don't want black power to be defined by the Kwame Ture's. We want to define it on our terms, which in today's United States is playing out perfectly, where power is identified often with business development and black capital. It's almost like a perfect success story from their point of view. Um, but all of this was being built up and shaped, uh, and particularly, again, from my own point of view and my interest is around the field of mass communication, again, this, and I said specifically, uh, it developed as a euphemism for psychological warfare. In the post-Second post World War moment, as the U.S. wanted to solidify itself as the single hegemon in the world, it created, along with other military and intellectual and media projects, it created what they call mass communication as an academic field of study, specifically designed to look how to manipulate, uh, to, to solve all of the problems in the United States of the day. How do you project American capitalism as the solution to the world? How do you create European immigrants as new white Americans and then everybody as consumers? How do you, how do you recreate formerly enslaved Africans as Negroes and American citizens, again, in the context of becoming good capitalist consumers. All of this was part of the project openly expressed. How do we manipulate? How do we get poor white men to go to war? How do we get um, uh, women into the workforce when those men are at war? All of this was studied in terms of manipulate. How do we get people to consume? How do we reduce their, their cognitive capabilities and their intellectual uh, 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 potential? How do we limit their political dreams as Fanon discussed? All of this was more or less in various ways openly talked about uh, in, the, in the development of American mass communication with the idea that this was all understood to be a euphemism of psychological warfare, which is why I keep using that um, phrase. Uh, and then, they, and then uh, over time it would become rebranded in euphemism as of course public relations, uh, marketing, branding, advertising, strategic communication, uh, message force multiplication, mass communication, what are the other ones? Intellectual warfare, worldview warfare, translating of course from the Germans, uh, and so on. But the idea was, again, how does a tiny elite manipulate a growing and uh, diverse society to operate under its... So here comes Robeson into all of this. And again, we were, you know, I was talking about this recently in terms of a Kanye West comments, and maybe we can come back to this, but, but to understand, for instance, why Kanye West would be around to criticize Jews in the media industry, we would need to understand why Jews ended up in the media industry in the United States. And we would have to understand the basics of how that was the field, uh, the, the, the arena left to them by the elite who said, we don't want any part of this. This is, we want you, we, we want to allow the savages to create entertainment for the rest of the savages. We don't want Jews and Negroes and whoever else showing up in our opera houses and in our theaters and in our classical, you know, whatever. We don't want, we want you in vaudeville and we want you on the stage in your little ghettos and, 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 and neighborhoods. And then when you go out to LA, we want you to perform the task of developing Hollywood in such a way that it uh, matches the political interests of the state. And then if you look at the history of, I mean, there's just so much in there that we, we don't have time today to get into, but that is often never discussed, that is rarely discussed. Why is it that the first anti-Nazi film to come out of Hollywood is from Charlie Chaplin, a Gentile? In other words, why were the Jews in Hollywood initially quiet on that? Why did they change later on? You know, what, what was the political will of the state that encouraged Hollywood to produce in certain ways? And then what was Hollywood wanting to produce in terms of black people's performance in... So anyway, I'm gonna come back to a little bit of that. I just wanted to throw that out there a little bit. So this is why, again, I'm saying that my iron triangle of you can't be rich, famous, and radically political at the same time comes is, is, is again, just a simplification of, of, of the point that celebrity and 
uh, popular culture are highly politicized and combative spaces where even the term entertainment is used in, in, uh, in particular to create a euphemism for the psychological warfare that's taking place and to reduce people's critical capability. Because of course, if we think it's just entertainment, and that's even become like a, a, a bullying stick when people want to, you know, when, when they hear a critique of a film or, or a television show or something, the first thing we're encouraged to say, it's just entertainment. I get the comment more than anything. Oh, Jared, you're doing too much. I just saw a comment, in fact, yesterday I post something on YouTube and I got the, the one critical comment, because of course that's the one we always, that sticks out to us is the criticism, was, was literally telling me, you're doing too much, it's just a movie. Talking in this case about One Night in Miami. Now, I don't know if you, any of you are familiar with it, but anyway. Just another attempt to reduce Malcolm X to something silly and unthreatening. But the point is, the criticism was, you're doing too much. You're thinking too much. I love that you're laughing, because I, 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 I hate that. Why would, why, what do you mean I'm thinking too much? What kind of, what kind of? <laughs> I never would consider that to be a critique, like, a, like an, an insult. You're thinking, you're thinking too much. Oh, no, 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 but the fact, and, and again, from the perspective of those who, who perform propaganda and have studied and, and developed the field, so to speak, that is understood to be the case. We'll call it entertainment and it'll reduce people's critical capabilities. It'll make them more susceptible to the messaging. So I also talk about this in the context of an internal colonial dynamic with, with black people and the United States. Uh, and simply put, the, the, I'm borrowing from a, a, an older theory, uh, internal colonialism theory that has been suppressed in the United States, but I think makes the most sense when trying to perform an analysis of what's actually going on. And if you look at black people as an internally held colony, just as you would uh, any other traditional colony, you can start to see that the relationships and the, the, the behavior is very similar, very extractive. So again, you know, going back to my work in hip hop, how do you have a hip hop uh, industry that produces well, more, well over 40 billion, 50 billion dollars a year uh, in all of its facets, but yet the South Bronx community out of which hip hop is said to have originated in New York is literally materially worse off today than it was in 1970. How do, we, how do we reconcile that reality? How do black people continue to produce all of this culture and wealth and energy and, and, and intellectual output, whatever, and yet their communities are materially as, as uh, bad today as they've ever been? Um, and that's often misunderstood because of the imagery and the, you know, like Malcolm X said, the United States has perfected the science of image making and it can project a condition of black experience in the United States that is wholly unrealistic uh, um, or distorted in its view. So it's often, even for black people who show up in my classrooms, it, who come from the poorest communities, they themselves are often confused about their own condition in part because they are conditioned to see over a horizon, uh, uh, to, to see in fantasy over a, and a horizon that just on the other side, black people are doing well. So I just need to get over there never realizing that that, is, that that over there doesn't ever exist. Um, so in that context, so, it, so then if we go back and we look again, the, the world or the context Paul Robeson walked into, the United States, its pop culture, for those who are unclear on this, has always and only ever been determined by what black people produce. There is no mainstream popular culture in the United States going back to the days of enslavement if there is not the production and the extraction and the, the misrepresentation and the, the abuse of black performance, both in terms of literal performance of black people performing or whites or others performing a blackness. It also set in, as a base the reality that it's, I think, continues to confound that the target audience for all of this are white affluent Americans primarily. It's, so when, even when we see black media and black performance, even in what are said to be black films, the target audience are not black communities. Um, they are, the, 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 the product has been created to perform a psychological warfare assault on black people to confuse, to, to 
uh, distort, to negate certain politics, to produce other dominant narratives, but primarily the goal is to, to, to create a popular culture that eases the tension of the colonizer. It goes back, you know, what Fanon used to say about Radio Alger in, in, in Algiers. The point of it, and I've made this argument about National Public Radio or NPR in the United States, the goal of it is to make the colonial project seem safer and more relaxed. So, so as when we did some research on Tyler Perry, and I suffered through every, up to that point, Tyler Perry film, so you're welcome, and I am still suffering PTSD as a result, um, I think straight up, I think literally, I think it created a, 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 there's a trauma in that, especially if you watch them all back to back as I was doing for this, for this article, this book chapter. But in the research, we found a statement from uh, an executive, a white woman executive at Lionsgate Films that was at the time the, the, the um, distributor of Tyler Perry's films. And she said in the New York Times that he satisfies the niche of white audiences that want to see black films. In other words, she's saying, we want Tyler Perry to keep producing these films because white audiences want to see them. And then you can start to see what actually ap appears in these films that would ease the colonial project, that would make whites and others feel more comfortable at the continued horrific material existence of black people. Um, and there's a whole lot more in detail about that as well that, you know, we could detail about it in, in terms of Tyler Perry. I just, you know, don't want to, to sully a discussion of Robeson too much with that. But in other words, the context that Robeson entered when he starts doing things like saying, I'm not going to be the silly Negro African in your films anymore. I'm not going to perform the version of blackness that you want to have and walked away from, I believe in the 1930s, $100,000 a year, roughly, uh, salary, which at the time would have been enormous, um, and put himself in a, in a relatively precarious state as, as a result of not wanting to continue to have his art work against, or as Fanon said, testify against his own community. Um, yeah, I, do, I, I want to say again that we, we do have to understand that, that there is no popular culture in the United States without this form of black performance. From the earliest, whether again, whether it's the blackface performances, the minstrelsy, where, which involved both white and black performers blackening their faces to perform ultimately for white audiences, that formula of what makes uh, blackness popular has been largely uninterrupted in the years since. It is reformed, it has been rebranded, it has been made sophisticated. Uh, but that, that basic thread has, has remained unchanged. So when we, again, look into the context, and I'm just going to name a few, a few authors and, and, and works that I, I work from on a regular basis and think about quite often um, that help, again, set the context. Because on the one hand, if, if we don't understand the colonial relationship, everything becomes confusing. And then if, on the other hand, we don't understand some of the particulars of the, the origins of this environment that Robeson and, and all of us have walked into or forcibly walked, pushed into, uh, it continues to confuse. So um, whether it's, it's uh, Yasha Levine's Surveillance Valley, uh, um, this book I would encourage everyone to read. Uh, it, it, is, it is a very well-written book that tells the, the, the rise of the digital media environment in the United States is arising out of a very military uh, context. Of course, the internet is US military technology in its origin. Um, and uh, as, as Levine details in his work, the goals of those who would create, again, this largely digital media environment, we're, we're talking about this well back in the 50s in the context of we wanna bring counterinsurgency warfare that were engaged in in Asia back home uh, against our own internally held colonies of black folks and others, specifically targeting black folks with the same counterinsurgency messaging here that they were using in the in the jungles of of Vietnam and Korea. And the goal, uh, uh, and which I've always thought was interesting, because even if you go back and read some of the earliest newspaper reports of the Nat Turner Rebellion. Nat Turner and his crew are described even in the 1830s in the United States as insurgents. So I, I was like, wow, that's really deep. So all the way back then, that same language of counterinsurgency and the need to suppress 
this internally developed threat. I mean, black people are only a threat because the United, you're, you're enslaving and colonizing them. <laughs> it's like if you stop the abuse, the threat goes away. But from their point of view, they're saying, we're not stopping the abuse. The extractive relationship is too much, both materially and immaterially. Because of course, white people can't just be white without demonstrating the, the, the negative of being black. So you know, man can't be superior without demonstrating the inferiority of women. So it's like we can't, it, it, you know. And in my hip hop days, I used to point, it's the classic moment when, when, when 50 Cent put up, um, no, when Jay-Z was beefing with Mob Deep, rest in peace, prodigy, and, and he puts a picture on the, on the screen of, my, of, of this MC as a child in a ballerina outfit to, to emasculate him. And he says, and, and, and uh, um, no, 50 Cent did the same thing. But the point was, he, put the, he puts it and he points to the screen and he says, uses language I won't use here, but he says, that is that. I am a man. I'll just say it that way for now. And the point was, I can't just step up here and say I'm great and let you appreciate that for yourselves. I have to tell you I'm better than that. So that's in, in short how all of this is, is working. So, so psychologically, the, 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 the state at home is, and everywhere really is saying, hey, we can't just say black people are inferior. We have to constantly demonstrate this by you know, and, and even Walter Lippmann wrote that this was, you know, the famous American journalist wrote uh, in the 1920s, it's a self-defense mechanism. The projection of anti-black versions of black people is a defense mechanism for whiteness. With the goal that Levine lays out of suppressing a counterinsurgency effort. So when you have Paul Robeson coming in and talking about the labor movement and talking about socialist struggle and internationalism and redefining himself out of slave and black and of African American, which didn't exist in his time, but Negro and all this and calling himself an African, that was tremendously um, worthy of negation from the perspective of those in power. When Francis Stoner Saunders, who wrote one of my favorite books in the early 1990s called The Cultural Cold War, about how the CIA used arts and letters to manipulate as much as they could the world culturally. So it's not like a James Bond book, or, or, or I guess for us it would be Jason Bourne or whatever. You know, it's, not, it's not like that. It's, it's, it's very different. It's how do we place editors and academics and artists? How do we use... For, um, even Picasso's art as a way of presenting some sort of abstract Western colonial capitalism. Like this is, the, you know, how do we monitor black writers for what they're saying and not, you know, how do we put, I, I mean, and it's remarkable, what, all the, including of, of Robeson, all of the efforts, you know, uh, she even talks about how, how George Orwell was snitching on people and Robeson was on the list of people he was snitching on <laughs> saying, Robeson, you need to watch this guy. Um, what was the language he, he said, um, called Robeson anti-white. Imagine Robeson being called anti-white. And, while, and all, that, all, all that could mean is George Orwell saw himself proudly presenting himself as black and African, and that meant anti-white. So like, you know, any, any performance, particularly in Hollywood or in celebrity space that wasn't demure or coonish or Sambo-ish, is threatening, so therefore, oh, he's anti-white. If he had come out there buck dancing or something, Orwell probably would have been, oh, he's the best. It's the greatest. Anyway. Um, but what she's, so, and, and Stoner Saunders, has, in, in that book, has a, there's a reference to uh, um, an editor of, I believe it's called Encounter Magazine that was developed quietly by the CIA. I don't think that's the right word. It's the right name. Anyway, but they had created this magazine that would be used to promote, through art, the U.S. and U.S.-styled capitalism as, as, as the, the, the standard. Uh, uh, that, that, and, and in this quote, it, it says, I'm going to paraphrase and, and butcher it a little bit, but it really speaks to one of my favorite points about all of this. Because it's not, the, the, the conspiracy is more sophisticated. It doesn't require somebody to say, you go here and say this. So in this quote that she has from one of the editors of this magazine, he's responding to that idea and he says, look, we don't have to tell anyone to do anything. We just have to set up the standards for success and publication and prominence and people will find their way. 
And that's how it works. So, so in, in terms of, of, of rap music, a, a young kid looks at a video and says, that's how that, that artist is famous. I want to be famous. So they just start unconsciously or maybe even consciously reframing themselves, rebrand, reshaping themselves to fit that. Nobody has to tell that rapper to go talk about drugs and hurting your community and being anti-woman. And all. Nobody has to do that. You just have to show by, being, by supporting what you want that this is, this is how it works. So the same thing happens in academia. Nobody has to tell an academic, don't say that, that socialism stuff. Don't talk about pan-Africanism. Nobody has to say that. You just see who's the famous academic and what do they talk about? How do they write? And then you follow along because that's what we, and then you, you hope you can work your way in there. Often not realizing those spaces are limited. So even if people try to <laughs> copy one another to get in there, there's only a handful of placements. You know, there's only so much celebrity and popularity that, that is available. Uh, and by the way, so, so you know, the, in Hollywood, when they talk about the star system, it's politicized. The star system in Hollywood is officially described as we create a star and then put them in everything, assuring success for that product, project. But it's also a political, or a, a, a political statement because how does one be selected for creation and maintenance and sustenance as, or being sustained as a star? They have to present themselves as, as worthy with, you know, they're not untalented, so this isn't a critique of their talent. They have to present themselves as talent, having some talent. They have to present themselves as someone willing to produce the kind of art that will satisfy the broader counterinsurgency goals. And then they can be placed, held, held prominently, uh, and used to speak against those who might be coming up behind them. So I've often made the joke, but it's not really a joke that Jay-Z's, I would say Jay-Z's success and fame has only been sustained so that he could be in place to speak out against Colin Kaepernick however many years later. Or Snoop's career has only, Snoop Dogg's career has only existed this long because he's been sustained so that he is in place to speak out against as he did Kaepernick or whoever else and then he can go back to rebranding and popularizing this idea of black capitalism, capitalism, success in industry, so on and so forth. And then if you listen to him, Snoop and Jay-Z who are roughly my age and if you listen to their entire career, you hear the Fanonian e effect where Fanon talked about how in a colonial setting, artists are ossified, in a, in, well, that's in a, in a colonial culture, but they're also infantilized permanently. So you're listening to these men well into their 50s, parents, world travelers, Jay-Z's a billionaire, and the content of their lyrics has not changed at all. It has not matured at all. Jay-Z has the exact same content he came out with in 1996, Snoop, the exact same content he came out with in 1992. Uh, um, no sign of growth, which is why they're easily placed in connection with younger artists and nobody recognizes the difference when a 50-year-old is rhyming with an 18-year-old and, and everybody sounds the same. Nobody's saying, <laughs> you know. And increasingly that, my students, for instance, get offended, but I tell them, look, with all due respect, it's not that I'm hating on your generation, but I'm now in my 50s. I am not interested in hearing about every teenager's first sexual encounter and how they broke into the street and how they're taken over. Okay, I've been hearing that. I got it. I get it. I'm not hating on you. Congratulations. Do your thing. But I, I'm not, I, I, want, I would like to hear something else at this point. I have, in fact, grown. Uh, not without my childish moments. We talked about this last night. My, my oldest daughter is quick to remind me and ask me, are you five or 50? But, you know, I have my moments. But in general, I would like to hear, I can't just continue to listen to, again, teenagers breaking into, into, into life and sharing their experiences. Been there, done that. I appreciate you. Congratulations. Good luck. But the industry does that, of course, because they're targeting constantly 12 to 18-year-olds. That's the group, that's, that's what marketing and advertising and everybody's, that's where we get you. If you buy a Toyota when it's your first car, you're probably gonna buy a Toyota forever. If, you're, if the Nike is your first shoe, you're probably gonna buy Nikes forever. This is sort of the logic and we lock you in. And then by the time someone 50 comes back to, to, to critique that, the kids are already, I don't wanna hear from you, I'm good, you're old, move on. Separate generationally, you can have no impact on us. You're, you know, and then I'm, 
playing a role, you know, I'm willingly, I guess, going along with it by saying, I don't want to hear, you know. And then, of course, we have to recognize these children, these young people are being produced and even songs written by 40 and 50 year old often men. So then what are we, what, what are we, again, what are we looking at here in terms of celebrity? Um, another quick reference, we have to talk, uh, mention very quickly here, uh, 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 um, if you haven't read it, if you're, very, if you're interested in these associated uh, topics, a book called National Security Cinema is something I've been talking a lot about since it came out. Um, Essentially, what the book is showing is how the Defense Department, the Pentagon, have been highly involved in producing American television and film since about 1911, uh, with an increase uh, after the Second World War. Um, and thousands of films and television shows, the whole propaganda, as we call it, of, of endless shows about the police and the, the value of the police. And if there's a, a corrupt cop, it's a bad apple who's easily corrected by the goodness of the, the, the institute, all of these, like, they're literally directed, produced by, written by, executive, you know, by CIA, NSA, DOD, like all of these, and, and, and you know, and it's like, <laughs> again, all to create a situation where a Robeson-like figure is, is, is anathema, can't be acceptable. Um, I talk a little bit about the work often about uh, from Ben Carrington, because I think when we talk about, uh, you, you know, there's an overlap with sports and celebrity, and it's really, I think, ultimately about celebrity and managing popularity. But he has this great, you know, when he talks about the history of colonialism in sport, Ben Carrington does in, 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 in uh, at least one of his books. He has this moment where he talks about the U.S. military going into Latin America and literally he quotes an, an army colonel, I believe, saying something to the effect, we have to give these people baseball bats or they will pick up guns. So the, 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 again, just a reference to the role that sport is meant to play in a colonial project. It's, again, distraction, physical energy, you know, exerted in, in, in uh, Certainly in the United States, eventually an industry is created where you create, a, a, again, a very colonial relationship with black communities and now in, certainly in baseball with Latin American communities uh, where these communities see as their only way out of their oppressive conditions created by these same people is through playing these sports. And of course, then their celebrity is manipulated to be used against radical political movements and arguments. All right, so let me, let me start to come to a, a conclusion here. And, oh man, I actually had I'm, I'm way more than that, okay. Do you all, I, let me at least say this. There is, if any of you are familiar or not, I wanna at least put this out there. There is this, in, in, in the United States, a battle rap culture underground scene. I don't know if you all are familiar with this or how much you pay attention to it meaning that it's not the, the official industry of rap music, but it's a, a lot of very talented rappers who in one-on-one -on -one competition, often with very hostile language, compete with one another in verbal battles. Um, one of the more prominent members of this community, his name is Math Hoffa, one of my favorites, and he's got a great platform that I would encourage any of you interested in these things to, to check out. They have conversations in a barbershop about the music industry that often get I think very interesting and more real than we're used to hearing. And in one of the more recent conversations, uh, he's interviewing uh, an MC who I'm not really familiar with. Um, I have to go back and check, but he had a, a lot of industry experience. And he, he said here, and I'm quoting him, he said he was speaking to an industry um, uh, executive at one point, uh, and I think even in, in a studio engineer. And um, the man told him, quote, forgive the language, but quote, I don't give a fuck about the music. I'm here to sell advertising, end quote. And the rapper was shocked. But the point, and I think it fits well with what I'm trying to quickly outline here today, is that the, from the industry's perspective, the art is irrelevant. The talent of the artist is only a value in their ability to reach their own audience or an audience of white consumers in this case. Uh, but, but beyond that, the goal is to sell advertising, which from my lens, seeing what advertising really is, is 
we're here to use this music for psychological warfare purposes, to create confusion, hostility, disunity, intra-group hostile behavior, and so on and so forth, um, or simply to reduce your audience to consumers. I thought that was very telling. Anyway, so let me just, ra I'll, I'll wrap up by saying this, There's a, there, and maybe and we can c talk a little bit about this in some Q&A or hear from others or whatever. Um, I wanna make the point that Robeson, Paul Robeson had to have his life destroyed and his memory all but erased from particularly the United States and even black communities in order for us to be susceptible and, and uh, willing to give legitimacy to people like Kanye, Jay-Z, Snoop, etc. In other words, artists like Hazel Scott, Canada Lee, athletes like John Carlos and Tommy Smith, artists like Tupac Shakur, their lives have to either be destroyed, careers destroyed, memories distorted, suppressed, erased entirely, so that this new crop can be in placed to perform the counterinsurgency project. Tupac started going in the wrong direction with his fame, blending it too much with his politics, and obviously the money he had accumulated, so therefore, whatever people want to believe about what happened to him, either way, his career was going to be over, it was going to go off rails had he survived that night. Um, uh, it was already, I think, happening, uh, just career-wise. In other words, there was going to be no way he was going to be uh, uh, allowed to become or rise to the level of a Paul Robeson. The mistake of Robeson has never been repeated. There has never been another celebrity artist, athlete out, coming out of anywhere, really, but the United States that has risen to that level. Uh, and one of the things that I appreciate and what I'm, I'm anxious to hear more about later from, from Dr. Horn is the reminder of just how famous Paul Robeson was. I think that we are encouraged not to re realize that he was as famous then as anybody is today. There is, no, there is nobody as famous or more famous than he was in his day. And it, I think it's hard for us to understand that, particularly in this digital age when anybody can, you know, we can't just post and do all this other kind of stuff, but that's how big he was. And when, you, when we look at, to, it, at, at, again, just even some of what I've talked a little bit about today, you could see the state globally, the interlocking states or whatever, were terrified of this man. When we read or listen to his son, rest in peace to him as well. Uh, it was very clear. I mean, I remember Robeson Jr. giving a, a talk where he talked about the FBI had loosened the lug, nut, lug nuts on, on his father's car in the hope of creating a car, you know, all kinds of stuff, which may sound crazy to some people when you look at the, you know, even the unclassified documents, the counterintelligence program documents, and other, the, the idea that they would have done that is not really far-fetched and probably should have been seen as <laughs> predictable, actually. Um, So I'll end here by quoting uh, from the National Security Cinema book that I mentioned earlier, um, which I probably should have quoted earlier, but because I think it, it makes an important point here. Um, in their book, they write that, quote, the content of film and television is directly, regularly, and secretly determined by the U.S. government, led by the CIA and Pentagon. More visible since the 1980s is what we identify as a, a distinct genre, national security cinema namely those films that, that follow self-serving official histories and exalt in the righteousness of U.S. foreign policy. The files we have received through the Freedom of Information Act indicate that between 1911 and 2017, 814 films received DOD support. If we include the 1,133 television titles in our count, the number of screen entertainment products supported by the DOD leaps to 1,947. So we can see that they're active in trying to create a context that Robeson was clearly looking to explode uh, uh, and therefore could not be sustained within. Um, so I want to, as much as possible, always want remind people of that and uh, raise up Paul Robeson. And did I mention, I think I left, I think I skipped one of my points here, that I was raised in a household where one of the most prominent stories told from my mother was that she got to dance with Paul Robeson once in a meeting in New York. Um, uh, an, activ an, an activist, you know, artist, you know, so from day one, before I even understood who he was, I danced with Paul Robeson. 
all right, I don't even, what does that mean? <laughs> like, then years later, it's like, damn, Ma, you dancing with <laughs> That was it, though? Why didn't you? <laughs> what was it? Anyway. Um, anyway, it's an honor to be here to talk about ropes and to be part of a group talking about this. this, this and uh, I hope I've added something uh, of value to the, to the conversation. Thank you all very much. And if we have time, I'm happy to Q&A, discuss, debate. Anyway, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jared. Wide ranging and uh, uh, so provocative as usual. Um, I guess uh, I could just uh, take the prerogative, ask the first question. Sure. Since you uh, were uh, talking about movies at the end and national security theater and national sec security film industry, mm -hmm. et cetera, TV industry, um, you, you do watch a lot of TV and film, right? Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and you do occasionally find some somewhat exceptional exceptions yeah. to the national, uh, to that, that overwhelming, uh, what, what seems to be that, that cohesive program of, uh, of propaganda mm -hmm. and, uh, and mind control or influence. Uh, you, can, you, can you mention a few of them? Or like, why do you keep watching? What are you looking for? Like, uh, and what, what have you seen recently that is? Uh, That's a good question. Well, I mean, I, I mean look, I'm, I'm you know, I was raised as a TV baby, latchkey kid. So I mean, part of it is I'm just, you know, stuck in that. Uh, the other part of it, I, I can often claim, you know, my students and the, 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 you know, the discussions we have in my classes demand or, or necessitate that I, you know. Um, but I am a consumer. I mean, I, I study this. I am. I challenge. But I'm, you know, I'm no different than most any other person. I am. I am susceptible to messaging. I am susceptible. I have interests that I, you know, I do, I call it the the Vernon philosophy of black media avoidance uh, in commemoration of a friend of mine who I used to work with, uh, Vernon, who said at one point, "I'm never going to watch another film with black people in it." And I said, I, and I was like, "Why? How could you?" He said, "Because we always are made to look bad." So I just want to go see elves and orcs and whites talking to white, like like fully white context. And I was like, "Wow." And years later, having read all this stuff and gone into tremendous debt to get a PhD, I've largely concluded that he was right. Uh, that at least what we, what we should do is engage with, with criticism and engage with, with uh, um, as I often say, uh, uh, simplifying something I got from a former professor of mine where he used to say, interrogate your preferences. And I would, you know, so I just tell students to ask yourself, how do you know what you know and why do you like what you like? And when you like something, given this context, you should become more critical of it. Not to, not to say you shouldn't like it, not to make yourself feel bad, but just to, what is it giving me that is satisfying? And then what is it really doing that for? Um, so I've been moved lately by this, this, this article uh, that Christopher Mott wrote about the woke imperium, where he talks about the use of the, 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 by the state of movements within the United States to promote itself as, as satisfying those concerns and projecting symbolically an advance that doesn't actually exist. And it's become, I think, terribly confusing. Uh, so we often get high quality, well-acted, performed, beautiful people giving us something symbolically that seems like we've moved forward. But if you look carefully, it's really got a, a, an undercurrent that's disturbing. So the first thing that comes to my mind, I don't, I, you know, and it, the, 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 when I walked out of the film, I did see it in the theater, I think this is before the pandemic, uh, the film Queen and Slim. And I, I remember walking out of the theater feeling like a way I hadn't felt in a long time. And I, there's many problems with the movie, but, but the simple fact that it had two dark-skinned protagonists who engaged in armed struggle against the police... <laughs> I was like, that's the shit. I was like, that that moves me. Um, so I remember thinking like, you know, there's all kinds of flaws. So I was like, it, you know, what if the movie was instead of them being on a first date, getting pulled over and engaging combatively with the cop, they, those two men, the, the man and the woman were leaving a meeting of an, under, you know, of an organization and then had to engage in that struggle. And then in the context of their being in that organization, struggle to get to Cuba as they did in the film. 
What if, you know, that would have, you know, but Hollywood can't do that. So we have to, you know, so sometimes we have to take what we can get and then make use of it or challenge it or try to dismiss it or whatever. But anyway, so that, that's one, that one really challenged me lately. Um, usually I'm challenged in moments, not by an entire film or show. There's like moments. Because they're good. The people know what they're doing. They make, they're talented people. The people that write this stuff and act it and shoot it, I mean, there's a lot of skill and talent there. So it's, it's, it's not, of no surprise that even I would be caught up. Um, but I'd have to think more. Maybe someone else can offer a suggestion as to what challenges that. But um, yeah, anyway. I was just wondering, um, what do you think of the work of uh, Dave Chappelle? Because you said that uh, there is no more D uh, Dave Chappelle. Dave Chappelle, yeah. ah, yeah. Mm. Because, um, yeah, maybe he's not Paul Robeson because he's not an activist, but still, I think he's one of the person who's resisting into his work. But and I would like to have your opinion on, on his work. As a, as a consumer, I've loved Chappelle for a long time, and I thought the Chappelle show was a real attempt at disturbing the arrangement and one of the reasons why I think he couldn't sustain himself in it. I don't, I don't put Chappelle in a Robeson category, but I think that necessarily, but I, I think that, that I, I, know we don't, I don't think we have time to really break it all down, but my, my, for instance, with this latest controversy, I have felt that Chappelle has been misunderstood in that he was taking a race first analysis in his criticism of the LGBT, uh, not community, but the way that really elite whites were taking advantage of that. That's how I interpreted what he was saying. And the resistance he's gotten is largely, I think an unconscious reaction to him taking a race first analysis, which is condemnable in the United States. In other words, him saying, my concern over the treatment of black people is primary is what I think caused him and causes him problems now. I'm not saying he made the argument perfectly. I'm not saying I agree with everything he said. I'm just saying that in my react, what I'm assessing is what I think is the reaction to him is largely, I think, a disingenuous one based on very conservative politics that are not interested in seeing anything that would be, again, race first and would argue in primar primarily in defense of black people. Um, but again, I think he's wildly talented and just too disconnected from radical political movements. You know, I've interviewed his mother twice. His mother, uh, I think she's still alive. Maybe she recently, oof. Anyway, she was a, is a brilliant black studies scholar. Uh, I would have liked, much like Kanye West with his, his mother, that I would have liked them to maybe follow along that track a little bit more. Um, and link up with the movements associated with black studies, which is itself an academic parallel to the black liberation movement in its origins at least. But Chappelle doesn't, we weren't able to, we did try to make a run to get to Chappelle like at one point, but we weren't, you know, he's, that's not the space he's in. Robeson, to the, what distinguishes I think a Robeson is he was connected to those movements. He wasn't just commenting on the days and the time, he was engaged, he was in those meetings, he was, in, he, was, he was trying to work with people in struggle. Chappelle I see more as someone observing and offering comedic intervention, but not full on advocating and participating. Like you don't see Chappelle at activist rallies and like, you don't, I mean, you don't see Chappelle giving speeches as Robeson was trying to in, in his career, certainly, you know, in, in, in anyway. Um, so that's, I, that's a quick, I hope that was of some value. I, don't know. You, I think we have time for uh, one more question. Yeah, okay. I just wanted to quickly add that those, those movements, those movements where uh, Robeson was speaking and uh, with, by now, or by Chappelle's time, those have been completely decimated right by the on. CIA and the FBI, where, you know, they're all dead. <laughs> and the movement slowly just kind of, uh, yeah, you know, you learn quickly. <laughs> you make a really good point, and one that I, I wish I would have made earlier, to be honest, that, that one of the problems that we have in cr criticizing or assessing the behavior of celebrities and stars is that the, the context of the time. Robeson did benefit from a global 
more overt and organized movement. Chappelle doesn't have that. Uh, the people I'm critical of, they don't have that. Um, and to your point, that has been the intent, the goal, get rid of those movements. We have, you know, so we have still to this day, Matulu Shakur is in prison. Leonard Peltier is in prison. Uh, Sundiata Coley just got out basically in time so he could die. Russell Maroon shows just in time so he could die. Jaleel Muntakeen, thankfully, is still strong, but let out at the very, you know, tail end. Uh, um, uh, I'm, I'm, Mumia Abu Jamal is still in jail. I mean, I, you know, these. So the movement is clearly still an issue uh, for for folks in power. Um, but but uh, uh, the the representatives of that move, of those movements are punished, uh, leaving room for the nonsense that we have now. So you make a really good point. It's an it's an important one. So I, I don't mean to. That's why I'm saying I don't want to put an undue unfair expectation on celebrities of today. In fact, that's why I'm trying to point out that whatever we think of Kanye or whatever we think of Jay-Z and whoever else, they're only here because those movements have been destroyed and people like Robeson destroyed and then o omitted in the histories. Um, so yeah, anyway, that's a very good point. Thank you. You have to uh, close it down, but if you have a very quick uh, comment, because uh uh, we, unlike yesterday, we are not really taking any breaks, and uh, that's also because, uh, but if you have a, sh a short comment you want to make. Just a small question about uh, the movie about Fred Hampton, and no, movies like that that are coming out uh, about the movement. What do you think about it? For the act of for sake of brevity, uh, I'll shamelessly plug our Black Power Media YouTube channel and my show, I Mix What I Like, where I've interviewed uh, Fred Hampton Jr. We've discussed this. Uh, uh, Rosa Clemente, who's also involved, background in the production of the film. Frankly, I, as I shared with them, I don't agree that the film should have ever been made. I think that they should have stood outside and against the film so that their criticisms of the film could be meaningful uh, and that the film was a, an horrific, empty, negating description of Fred Hampton and, the, and his struggle. It, I think it, it told through the eyes of an, an FBI informant, made make the FBI look like a one person operation with one bad apple. It was just a mess of a film. So I, I, I don't support it and I don't agree that it has any positive value, though they disagree with me. So to be fair, that's why I'm saying you should check out the discussions and follow up with us afterwards. You know? Thanks. <laughs> all right, everybody, thank you. Let's give a big hand to uh, Dr. Paul. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Paul.